when a psychiatrist meets the devil. By Zed Belinsky The house looked normal. It stood on a quiet suburban street with its New England Cape-style neighbours. The hydrangea bushes looked well-maintained, as if they had a tendency of creeping up on the windows above. From this distance, the flowers looked like blue wrapping paper that had been scrunched up and thrown onto the bushes. I noticed that every curtain in the place had been drawn shut. I was visiting the home of 17-year-old Lucia Krause. Her mother set up an appointment with me earlier that week. According to her, Lucia was experiencing some kind of psychosis. She had met several times with other professionals, but none of the treatments had worked. She had turned to me in a time of need, and I happily accepted. I said a quick prayer to St. Michael and rang the doorbell. A thin-faced woman opened the door. Her features were drawn out, and she looked like she had forgotten what a good night's sleep felt like. She greeted me in a red, fuzzy bathrobe and invited me inside. I stepped over the threshold and looked around. Dark in here, I admitted. The only light came from the glow of the TV, where Steve Harvey was making fun of some big bosom blonde that was showing way too much skin for a family-friendly show. Too much light makes Lucia's head hurt. Can I get you anything? Coffee? Mrs. Krauss asked, twirling her finger impatiently. No, thank you, I replied with a smile. I could tell by the strain in her voice she was eager to get down to business. Frankly, I was too. I was in a hurry to get home in time to catch my kid's game. Can you ask her to come downstairs? I'm right here. A voice behind me responded. My heart skipped a beat. But I managed to stifle my surprised reaction and calmly turned around. The young girl was sitting at the kitchen table. I could just about make out her face. The rest of Lysia blended into the veil of darkness behind her. Do you want to turn on the light? I asked cheerfully, not wanting to give away how weirded out I was by all of this. No. Well, I need to take notes so I can better remember our conversation. And for that, I need just a little bit of light. Is there a light I can bring over or... Light these candles. They should be good enough. She said with the same flat tone. Her face was an expressionless mask that hung severed in the darkness. Fucking teenage angst, I thought to myself. My body language remained positive. Looking back at it, I wish this case had been simple as just a teenager going through a phase. It would be a few months of saying fuck you to the man, and then they'd slowly figure out their place in the world with or without help. Great, I exclaimed. I lit the candle that had been conveniently placed on the kitchen table that sat across from Lucia. The light from the flame made her look like a jack-o'-lantern. Her mother sat in the living room quietly, when she was listening intently. So, Lucia, I said with a click of my pen, let me start off by saying what's going on with this whole living in the dark thing. People weren't born to be nocturnal. Does the light give you migraines? You know, I could prescribe you something to fix those. Those can be a real pain in the rear sometimes. At first, she didn't respond. I wrote her name and today's date at the top of my notebook in the meantime. I was old school when it came to taking notes. There was something about physically writing words that helped them stick in your brain longer. I looked up at her and patiently smiled. The key was to not force her into talking. There'd be no tapping of fingers or checking my watch. I would work with what she gave me. Overstepping my boundaries could result in some seriously impended progress. No, I don't think those would help, she said softly. Have you ever tried them? Like Excedrin or something similar? I can give you something stronger to help co- No, it's fine. Honest, the severed mask said, although with her jaw moving up and down, she now resembled a broken puppet. I decided to try and talk to her from a different approach. I started to bullshit with her. I made small talk and tried to find something we could mutually discuss. I asked her about school. She gave me the general teenage response. I asked her if she had any friends. She said she had a few, but would much rather spend time alone than with people. 
She called her friends fake. Asked a few questions that would suggest avoidant personality disorder, but checked that one off the list when she told me that she was a cheerleader. I then probed her school life through simple questions and scenarios. Do you get all your homework done on time? If a girl spilled her lunch tray on you, would you respond by punching her in the face? Her answers did not reflect any antisocial tendencies. As more personality disorders got eliminated, I started to ask about her hobbies. I asked her about her favourite shows on Netflix. I piped up when she mentioned Stranger Things, and I was golden. We started discussing the show like old friends. She was opening up to me. Her face was more animated now. She began talking with her hands, a sign of passion, a good sign. I quickly reviewed my notes. Given what I had known at the time, I jotted down SPD with a question mark. That's schizoid personality disorder. I began to leave the questions more open-ended. When did you start getting these headaches? I asked. More than a month now. I've heard you've tried to get help before, but it didn't work out so hard. Do you mind telling me what happened? They didn't understand. None of you do. Understand what, Lucia? The girl looked nervous now. Her eyes darted back and forth from corner to corner of the room. I could tell she was wrestling with something in the throes of her mind. Slowly, she leaned forward and whispered, They don't like light. What may have felt like top secret information to Lucia was casual business to me. Who doesn't like light? I asked in a rehearsed voice. The people who talk to me. No one else can hear them. So the girl had a type of schizophreniform disorder. A developing schizophrenia, if you will. She was experiencing auditory hallucinations. Nothing a bit of Haldol and routine checkups couldn't fix. They tried giving me antipsychotics, she said with wet eyes. As if she had read my mind, her voice was becoming unsteady. But they don't work. Nothing does. The voices only get louder, and things have been getting worse. Sometimes they talk through me and I black out for minutes. Do you think I could speak with one of them? And this sounded like disassociative identity disorder, coupled with some disassociative fugue. She was already worked up, and I'd have to calm her down after speaking to one of her voices. It worked like a telephone. I'd speak to the voice on the line for a little, then politely ask them to reconnect me with Lucia. Lucia was quiet for a moment. Her head slowly started to sink toward the table, as if she was meaning to kiss it. Suddenly, she jerked upright, shaking her head violently. No, no, they don't want to talk to you. Please, you must leave. They're so loud. It hurts. I stretched up my hand towards hers and warmly held it. Lucia, you must listen to me. I can help you. You have something that is treatable. I can make the voices go away. Lucia, it's all in your hand. It's simply your brain producing too much dopamine and causing your senses to go into overdrive. It makes you experience visual and auditory hallucinations. They aren't real. They're just a biochemical byproduct. I have drugs that can block the receptors that absorb the extra dopamine. And then I can get you something for those migraines and you'll be all set. You'll be fine, just stop crying. Please don't cry, please. This is very controllable, Lucia. Her forehead was now resting against the table. I continued to rub my hand over hers. Lucia? Lucia! I shook her head, but she did not stir. I stood up with such force that the chair I had been sitting on almost tipped over. I fumbled for the light switch. No! Leave that on! came Lucia's voice suddenly. Only, did my ears pick up on a second, more layered voice within Lucia's? The voice sounded ancient, like it had seen many moons. It also sounded irritated. I froze, my hand on the light switch. I thought about flipping on the light switch and telling Lucia that I was done playing her game, that I'd prescribe her antipsychotics and benzos and tell her to call me once a week. 
Then I'd have walked out that door and got home just in time to bring my son to his baseball game. But my hand never turned that light on. I remained motionless. Some deep, long, misunderstood curiosity was beginning to arouse within me. Some sort of primal instinct that had been present since the dawn of man and had since been leading men to their downfalls. I slowly turned to face Lucia. She returned my gaze. Her face still remained blank, but there was something in her eyes that even in the faded glow of the candle I could make out. They had turned pitch black. The two obsidian stones seemed to stare right through me. Although we locked eyes for no more than a few microseconds, it felt as though I had transcended hundreds of thousands of years, to a time when the forests were still young and the strange beasts roamed the earth, back to a time when humans weren't the apex predators. The silent spell was broken. Hi, Doc. Her tone sounded gleeful, almost mocking. My mouth dried up and it felt like cotton. It couldn't be. To whom am I speaking? I tried to strengthen my body posture, but I felt as exposed as a deer in the headlight. Suddenly I felt naked. Suddenly I was afraid. Lucille laughed. It sounded like a man's chuckle. From the living room I could hear sobs of Mrs. Krause. I propped myself up against the wall. The air felt electric. I took a deep breath and reminded myself that this was just a little girl, and that this could all be rationalized. Who are you? I demanded a second time with more confidence. You have no dominion over me, son of Adam! Lucia bellowed. The candle danced wildly and threatened to extinguish itself. First of all, my father's name was Luke. Second, am I speaking to Lucia? <laughs> Looks like we have a comedian here. We could use your company in hell, but first we need to clean up your act. Lucy's face was a sneering clown grin, her eyes two gaping holes in her head. Hell. I had a sudden, vivid flashback to my days at Academia. My school required us to take courses in theology, and I remembered one priest, Father Merrick. He was as wise as he was old. He taught me that no matter how much I thought I understood, the world would always have layers upon layers of complexity. I remember one lecture, he told the entire class something along the lines of, Remember that there are things unseen in this material world. Maybe one day you'll come across something in your travels. An event that you cannot explain. One that DSM cannot explain. Trust your instincts. You may be dealing with the devil in disguise. You've learned your demonology. Do not doubt yourself. Once you are certain that there is a demon infestation, then call the church. Now, I am a man of rational thought. I observe a problem and narrow it down until it can be solved. But something seemed wrong about Lucia. Something that made the birds stop singing and the room grow colder. Something that made your stomach sour and your hair stand on edge. If there really was a demon within Lucia, I had to prove it. I did not doubt such things existed, but I also learned that they grew in power through faith. I was no holy man, and had to tread carefully here. I might have been dealing with an ancient entity. In order to get the church involved, I had to make certain that I was dealing with an infestation of the demonic. There are several ways to do this. The individual can divulge hidden or future knowledge, speak in foreign tongues, demonstrate inhuman powers, or the entity gives you its true name. What's the matter? Cat got your tongue? Or have you figured it out by now? <laughs> when I didn't respond, it continued. You can call me Tommy for now. You know, you're the first person I've spoken to in a long time. The voice fluctuated like a wave in tone, from irritated to amused back to irritated. There was a faint smell of rotting flesh that came and went. Well, Tommy, what can I do for you? The urge to pull out my phone and record this conversation was great, but I did not want to draw any attention away from the girl. 
I want you to leave, Doc. As far away from this place as you can. I'm afraid I can't do that. I'm here to help Lucia. She is beyond saving, trust me. I'll kill her if you stay longer. Lucia drew a finger across her throat in a cutting motion. I heard no response from Mrs. Krause. Poor woman must have fainted. No, you're not. You're going to tell me what you want and together we'll come up with a solution. I needed to trick this thing into proving that it was a demon. The church wouldn't waste its time otherwise. I already told you what I wanted, you stupid fuck. Would you pay attention? Or have you been sneaking some of those sweet, sweet prescriptions? I remained silent, unfazed by Lucia's outburst. I was used to behavioural problems, I had to do my best to remain silent. I'm not leaving, I stated. And who are you to stop me? Come on, Doc. Don't you have a baseball game to catch? Lucia licked her lips lustfully. That one caught me off guard for a moment. But I may have disclosed this bit of information to the mother earlier. It wasn't enough to prove that Lucia had just displayed clairvoyance. That can wait. With your son, David, isn't it? Cute kid you got there. Nothing a quick Facebook search couldn't find. I wasn't impressed. I remained stoic as ever. I know what you want, Doc. I know that you suspect me, but want to prove that I'm something more than just a crazy person's delusions. You want me to be your monkey and perform magic tricks to you. Then you'd take that information and bring it to your church friends, and they'd send over those nasty priests with the purple stone to come evict me from my home. But I don't want that. No. The young girl's lips were beginning to froth. Do you know what that feels like, Doc? The words of your primitive language fail to describe it. I have found refuge in Lucia's body. She's helping me stay out of that horrible place. I have no intention of going back. Not you, not anyone in this plane can send me back. I will not go back! Lucia went into a frenzy of giggles. Her hands were clawed and her fingernails dug into the wooden table. I merely stood there, transfixed. Now, Doc, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. Either you leave now and we forget the whole thing happened, or I'll make sure your boy dies a slow, agonizing death. Perhaps a drunk driver will happen to be on the road today, or maybe he'll cross paths with a dangerous pedophile who specializes in necrophilia. What do you think of that, Doc? I want to slap the stupid grin off the girl's face. I think I even took a few steps toward her with an open palm. Then I saw something that made the color drain out of my face and my knees buckle. I was suddenly aware that I was in great danger and I had to flee. I thanked Tommy quickly and told him to take care. He bombarded me with vulgarities and called me a coward and a fucking quack, but I ignored most of those. I was focused on just getting out of there as soon as possible. I went into the living room, shook Mrs. Krause awake, and pulled her outside. With as best of a professional voice I could muster, I suggested she call an ambulance to bring her daughter to the hospital. She was going to be admitted to a psychiatric ward. I told her I would send help over there. The woman looked faint, and I held her hand over her mouth as I explained to her that her daughter was in great danger. When I finished, her knuckles were soaked with tears, and the orange light above the western horizon was amidst passing into a light shade of lavender. I fled that quiet suburban street in a hurry. On the way home, I called the local church where I had several connections. My word would be enough to send a priest over to check on Lucia, and they would deal with the problem. I told them what I saw when I approached Lucia at the end of our interview. As I neared the young girl, I approached something standing behind her. A slither of light from the closest drawn window must have hit it just right, because what I saw would fuel my nightmares for the next couple of weeks. It was a figure, 
but it looked wicked and inhuman. Its eyes were sunken. It had hair all over its body. It was black all over, like it had been charred by fire. It had long nails attached to a contorted hand that rested on Lucia's shoulder. The thing had two thick horns growing out of its scalp. It saw me and revealed a row of crooked teeth. It looked down at Lucia, who now wore a face of terror. She had mouthed the words, Help to me. I immediately took my leave after that. I was no holy man, and Lucia's fate had been passed from my hands. I prayed for her safety, as well as my own.